Hey everyone, and welcome to the Ballet and Beyond podcast, where we interview current and former professionals, teachers, patrons, and more from the world of ballet and dance. You'll get insight from top dancers and instructors in the industry, as well as local performers and educators as they talk about their experiences in the business. I'm your host today, Pete Commander. If you're from the greater Baltimore area, don't forget to check out Charm City Ballet, located in Cockeysville, where we offer classes for all dancers ages 3 through adult. Visit www.charmcityballet.com for information on classes, auditions, and upcoming performances. This is episode 3 of Ballet and Beyond, and we're excited for today's guest from ABT, Alex Basmeji. After starting her training at the Academy of Dance Arts and later at Studio Maestro in New York, Alex joined JKO School in 2004. After graduating, Alex moved to Spain where she spent three years as an inaugural member of the Correa Ballet Castilla y Leon in Segovia. In 2011, she returned to New York and joined ABT as a core member. Thanks so much to Alex for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start by talking about your uh, path the path that you took going from JKO school to actually becoming a company member at ABT. Um, tell us a little bit about that and your time in Spain. Sure. Um, my path was a little different than most. Um, I started at JKO school when I was probably about 16 years old. It was the first year the school had opened. There was only 12 of us in the whole school. So it's pretty different to how it is now. Um, but I was there for my last two years of study, and when I graduated at 18, I did not get a contract with uh, the ABT Studio Company, which is the next step into the company. Um, it just wasn't the right time for me, and uh, I was completely devastated at the time because I, you know, that's the dream to go one step to the next, and mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of the end of the road for me at ABT. Um, so I took some time to process what I wanted to do next. And I started going to open auditions and um, just kind of getting a feel for what other companies were out there. And so I didn't really prepare myself for that because I kind of mm. thought that it would just be one thing into the next into ABT. So I started doing, doing open auditions and I got a few contracts to smaller companies, but nothing that no company that I really felt passionate about. And I had a teacher that kind of, you know, said to me, what are you crazy? Just take one. And I, I didn't want to go somewhere that I knew I wasn't going to be happy dancing mm. the rep that they did or not. I don't know, just it, it didn't feel right to me. So I kind of held out a little bit. And at that time, Angel Correa, who was still a principal in ABT, was starting a company in Spain. So I had known him just through the grapevine of being in the school. And um, I went out to Madrid with a friend of mine who was also in JK with me, who didn't get a contract to the stu studio company. And we went and auditioned. And I talked to him afterwards, immediately after, because I had a, a different contract waiting um, for a smaller company. And I asked him straight out. I said, I, you know, I need to know now because I have this other thing that they need to know. And I have to give them an answer. And... Mm. He was like, yes, of course, you have a core contract here. And I mean, what 19-year-old doesn't want to move to Spain? And, right. <laughs> um, so I I called the other place and I, you know, I said, thank you, but no thank you. And I started mm. the company the following year because they were still opening. So I had like mm. a whole year off of just staying in shape. And I got a normal job to pay for ballet <laughs> class and all that mm. stuff. I was working in a retail store and taking class when I could and or I, try, I took like two classes a day every other mm. day and then I would just take class in the morning and go work the rest of the day on the off days. Um, and so I was in Spain for three and a half years, about three and a half years. Okay. And it just, um, it felt like time to try again with ABT. Mm. I was always in the back of my head the whole time that I was there. I never really let that dream completely diminish. Um, so I was visiting my parents here because my parents are in New Jersey. Okay. Um, and I came into class with ABT uh, two days. And then I went to Boston into class with them for two days because I was just trying to get back to the States to see mm. if it was time. And ABT called me and they said, can you start Tuesday? 
And wow. I didn't go back to Spain. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that's kind of my path into the company. It was, you know, it took a loop, a, a side, a side, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A sidetrack, I guess. Right. But, um, that was eight years ago now. Mm. So I've, I've been there since then. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So what can you, if you were to talk to somebody who was also, let's say, coming out of JKO school or another or another academy, yeah. um, what would you, what sort of advice would you give them about navigating uh, a career in dance? Um, I think it's so easy in this world, in the dance world, to, um, when you hear no or when you hear that maybe not now, it's so easy to just accept that and mm. kind of give up on it, on whatever it was you're going for, whether it was a company or a role or something something like that but a lot of times in this world no means just not now mm. um which i think you don't really hear that much it's a lot of it is timing a lot of it is what type of dancer they need at the moment who mm -hmm. can fill this role at this time um so i think to not i mean of course it's going to be discouraging in that moment Mm -hmm. To not let it sink to the point where you give up on it, to mm. just kind of maybe use that as fuel to work on something different with yourself, whether you can work on a technique or work on your artistry or work on whatever you feel like can maybe push you more into that next step. Right. Um, right. Because I was, I mean, I was completely heartbroken when they told me no. I thought that was it. And it took a lot of. Uh, support and strength to be like, okay, this isn't the only way. This isn't the mm. only place to dance or anything like that. So it takes a, a bit of a mature thinking at a young age, which is mm. like a lot of that um, happens within this this world. It's making decisions that maybe at your age level you're not ready to make, but or if you don't have all the information to make, and maybe looking back on it now, I see that that if someone had maybe sat down and be like, okay, if no is not always definitive, a hundred percent. No, like there's right. other things out there and there's other ways to get there. And mm. so that would be my advice. Okay, that, great. Yeah. Great. So you had mentioned being part of the, uh, the AB teach masterclass program. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell, tell us about that. Like, what is it? Where, how did it start? Okay. Where did it come from and all that? Um, AB Teach is a, a program I started uh, maybe like two years ago now. I've done a few master classes uh, here in the city and, and down in Virginia. Um, it's something I started because I felt like being in the corps de ballet, uh, now a senior corps de ballet member, um, mm. it's pretty apparent that there's a bit of a disconnect between coming out of a school and going into the corps de ballet especially nowadays with all the competitions and everything like that um everyone's practicing variations a hundred percent the same variation all year long for your one shot in the competition which is fine but usually that's not the reality of how a ballet career goes it's right where you'd go from a school to being a principal dancer or a dancer that would do a variation their first year in the company mm. um and I realized that there wasn't, nobody was teaching anyone what it is to dance in the corps de ballet. Because it takes a different kind of technique. It takes a different um, skill set. So it was something that I had started, and not just to, within the corps de ballet, but also a different artistic quality of dancing in a company than in a school. So it was kind of tying those two mm. things together, starting right away from ballet class. Yes, we would focus on technique, we would focus on um, building strength and all that, but also incorporating the artistic side right from class. So like the use of the port bra and the use of the head, not just getting stuck looking at the mirror with no, no feeling right. behind any of it. Mm. So we started talking about that right from the beginning. And I had people from ABT from all different ranks coming and teaching class. So sometimes it would be... Uh, like Isabella Boylston taught a ballet class, um, which was also fun because people get to see her on her normal level and right. on stage. Mm. So that I think was fun for people because she's 
you know, she's very, um, she's funny and she's very down to earth. So I think people were surprised to see that. Um, and then we had a few other people teach a variations class. And then, like I said, not just executing the steps, but more the feeling behind it, why you're doing it this way, why, what the story is to this particular ballet. Because a lot of times people don't even know the stories to these variations that they're dancing, who they are in the greater scheme of the ballet, Mm -hmm. which influences the steps. So we did that. And then I would lead a court of ballet workshop where we would do either the entrance of swans from Swan Lake or Giselle peasant dance or something like that. The things that you are going to dance majority of the time when you first join a company. Mm. So we worked on, um, following in a line, staying in line, dancing one behind the other, um, pattern work, running, because there's a lot of running involved in court of ballet work, things like that, um, that you don't really, until you do it, you don't really understand how it kind of works because you're not alone out there and you all have to work together. So Mm. it was, it's interesting to see. And a lot of the, the dancers afterwards were like, yeah, I never... I never realized, like, this is what it took. And I said, especially for me, I'm a tall woman, so I'm usually in the back. So you have to adjust your dancing to fit behind a woman who's leading the line, who's maybe, like, five inches shorter than you. Mm. So it's, you have to really adjust what feels comfortable or or what you feel is natural. You have to kind of hone it in a little bit and and really breathe all together, move all together, making sure everyone's ready to go before you run and everything like that. So it's that's kind of what I did. I was trying to bridge the gap between school life and company life. So people had a more realistic idea of really what it is to join a ballet company, what you're really going to be doing in the beginning. Right, right. Um, I know a lot of our, a lot of the dancers we've worked with tend to think of their own core work as more like a throwaway type of they're just there so why is it important like for for dancers to learn to dance in the core and to be a to to be a uh, member of the corps de ballet well the corps de ballet is i mean anyone that you talk to is the backbone of any especially full-length classical ballets but even in contemporary work um we are the thread that keeps the story all together um, through classical ballets. We are ma- creating the scenes of whatever it is, if, whether we're doing a big palace dance number and we're guests of the lead characters or your villagers in the town, you are setting the tone for mm. the whole rest of the story. Um, and, and without the aid of the court of ballet without the support of the court of ballet, the principal dancers can't do their job of there of telling their stories either, because it's usually a group effort. It's a group scene. It's, um, it's really, they're the supportive cast to the rest of the principal dancers, which if mm. you watch, if you just picked a part of, uh, a potata from a, one of a big classical ballet out of context there's no story it's just steps right but then you put people mm. around them and you have them involved with them and then you see well this is where the story unfolds so and then also as a court of ballet member to dance with these people and to know that your role is so important is so self-gratifying because you're you can create these beautiful images that look like paintings but live paintings on stage and and take pride in the fact that you're you're a part of this it's Mm. it's it's self-rewarding i think um and no part is a throwaway part at all ever in the ballet world so glad you said that (laughs) it's it's and you should take every role that you do with the same importance because if not then why you should always care about what it is that you're doing no matter Mm. if it's dance or not so why there should never be a thing that you're like oh this doesn't matter because it it does matter Mm. so you when you were when you were in spain you were you were uh doing principal roles and soloist roles is that is that accurate 
Yeah, I did um, a bunch of variations, and I did get a chance to do a few principal parts, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about the difference uh, between those two positions and sort of the training and lifestyle factors that go, uh, that go into each of those and how they're different. So in Spain, yeah, I did a bunch of mostly soloist, like, variation mm-hmm. roles. Um, and then I did get the chance to do, I learned, like, I learned Gamzati from Bayader, but I never, I just understudied it. Um, mm-hmm. And then I did a principal role in a Christopher Wheeldon ballet called uh, DGV. Which okay. That was, like, my big, one big principal role that I did there. Um, still being a member of the corps de ballet, I was still in the corps there. Okay. But, um, it's, it's different in... I don't want to say pressure because everyone has the pre- feels the pressure to perform well, but in mm. knowing that almost all the time there's people watching just you is is different than in the core because mm. in the core it's kind of the overall the overall picture. Um, you're part of a bigger being, and in a solace and principal environment, it's you know you know you're being you're being watched by the majority of the audience. Right. So I think it's just like knowing if you have one little slip up that you're like, oh, people definitely saw that. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, I mean, most of the times the public doesn't even realize. We realize or maybe the artistic staff realizes. And we right. Um, so I think it's it's that. And then the, the difference between like the dancing in Spain and dancing in ABT, uh, ABT is very fast paced. There's not a lot of rehearsal time for anything, really. So you have to be very quick and very secure and confident in what you're doing almost from the get-go. Mm. Where in Spain, you know, the schedule is a little bit more... It wasn't as demanding, so we had more time to prepare. So you felt a little bit more comfortable when you did step out on stage because you had been rehearsing this role for a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes in ABT, you have, like three, maybe four rehearsals, and that's it. And then you're out there in front of, you know, at the Met, it's like 4,000 people. Right. Um, Right. So there was a difference. That's like a big, a big, a big factor with depending on what company you're in. Um, Because I did a few seasons ago, I did my first like variation with ABT. And I remember feeling very nervous before. Mm. Not just because it was ABT, but because I felt like the prep time was so much shorter than variations past that I had done. Okay. So just like, you know, you you didn't have the, a lot of time for it to sink in and, and feel comfortable with it. How but, much guidance do core members get from the directors in creating character and, and maintaining, like you said, the overall picture? picture. Um, it's actually really pretty well done uh in abt we have so each group like court of ballet women court of ballet men soloists principals have uh pretty much their own like ballet master that works mm. exclusively with that level uh with that group um so we get most of our information from that one person and then every now and then uh kevin mckenzie who's our director when we have our big group rehearsals you know we'll we'll uh, emphasize what needs to be done in certain parts and and he's very 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 big on acting and, and mm. keeping within character i also do a lot of character roles uh not like character i mean yes character dancing roles but character roles within a ballet like, like the queen or the countess or things mm-hmm. like that um, and the story and keeping in character is so important uh, I did Lady Capulet and Romeo and Juliet for the first time last season. And just like the wealth of knowledge that I got from the staff of just a minor gesture or where your eye line should be in this moment to portray a mm. certain feeling. And it was, I mean, it was eye opening and it was pretty awesome to get that kind of, um, to get that kind of coaching Within a bigger ballet, within, like, the corps de ballet, we usually get, like, an overall sense. But a lot of times it's kind of up to you to know, to hear from either the senior members or, or know the stories kind of before you come in and, and know where you fit within the the line of the of the story. But um, I think it's, I mean, I think it's super important. It influences everything. It influences mm. every movement you do, whether it's just 
you know, you can do a port bra with no feeling behind it, or you can do a port bra like a villager lady, or like a swan, or like a flower, or, you know, it's just, and it could all be the same arm movement, but it has three different qualities behind it, and it's important right. to know why it is you're doing what it is, because mm. it has meaning, it has a reason for it, otherwise the choreographer wouldn't put it there. Right, right. Mm. So, uh, last, last subject, um, as some of our audience knows, uh, you're only a few weeks away from your, from your due date. I uh, am. Yeah. Um, and it's a boy. <laughs> yes. It's a boy. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So assuming that you're going back to performing, um, what are some of the things that you've done over the last eight months to keep your mind and body ready to, to jump back into class and rehearsal? I, so I performed still with the company until I was about 16 weeks pregnant. Okay. Um, I was still dancing. I did, I did Nutcracker, uh, before the company, nobody knew that I was pregnant during that. And okay. then I did two tours of Harlequinade, or uh, Alexi Romanski's Harlequinade, hmm. one to California and one to DC. And DC was my last, my last hurrah for a while, <laughs> um, and so after that, I pretty I was taking class pretty regularly in the beginning. So it's super important to stay active, especially if you were active beforehand. They mm -hmm. kind of tell you to to try to maintain the same kind of routine. I mean, obviously not as demanding and stressful, but to not just all of a sudden like plop on the couch for nine months. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So I was taking class pretty frequently, and then as it was, I was getting bigger and it was getting a little bit harder. For the majority, I took class at least twice, sometimes three times a week, um, in point shoes and everything up until maybe about six or seven months, mm. um, and like obviously fading out the jumping and all that stuff. Just by the end, it was mostly just bar and maybe like a tondu combination in the center. Okay. Uh, uh, and I did that pretty much up until like two weeks ago, maybe mm. three weeks ago. Um, it just got it gets harder. I mean, you know, there's all this extra weight on your body and it, you really feel it in your joints because there's relaxing now in my body that makes mm. like your ligaments and all this stuff uh, change. Right. So you have to start to calm down by the end. And then also just to stay involved in the ballet world, I participated in uh, ABT does a national, their national curriculum. They do a training program for teachers to teach, oh, wow. teach the curriculum. Um, so I did that and I got certified in all levels from pre-primary through level seven. So that was oh, like wow. a three and a half week program, mm -hmm. um, which was really fun for me. It was with my original teachers from the JKS school. They're the oh, ones cool. that created the program, uh, Franco DeVita and Ray Raymond Lukens. Mm. So it was fun for me to be in the studio with them because it had been, gosh, over a decade before, since I had been with them. And, um... It was nice, and it was a super interesting experience to see from the teacher side of it and how to teach a class, um, not just in structure of combinations, but in, like, a, a developmental way from from baby babies from, like, three years old all the way up through 17. Mm. Um, it was interesting because they put so much thought behind it. They worked with psychologists and with doctors and... And a lot of the pr the very beginning was actually a lot of helpful information for a new mom, <laughs> like how to teach a, a child, how children learn, how their brains work. And, mm. um, it was very interesting. I thought it was it was pretty cool. Mm. So I did that, which was which was fun, and it was a good way to stay within the community, but not so demanding on the body. Right. Uh, although right. they do give you class of the level that you just learned. So that was funny in the beginning. So you had like a bunch of adults running around doing a pre-primary, you know, butterfly arm uh, <laughs> class <laughs> and uh, stuff, making up stories and uh, combinations like that. You know, marching elves and all this stuff. Right, right. All the way up right. through like the highest level, which those classes were way more challenging. Mm, <laughs> mm. Um, and I barely got through them, but, but mm. it was good. So that was the one thing. And then I also went and sat and watched the ballet a few times, which is something I haven't done in a really long time, watching from, you know, from the front through a performance, not just like a dress rehearsal or something like right. that. From start to finish, it, I can't even remember the last time I had done that. So, so what, are some, what are some things that you 
having done that and it had been a while, what are some things that you sort of noticed about your company, your fellow company members and, and things that made you think of uh, about yourself that you ha- wouldn't have thought of without having sat and watched? Right. Um, it's funny. So to get away too from this from a while, like, your perspective kind of changes a little bit because I haven't been in the studio with the company in many months now. Um, And it was funny to see some people like who stood out to me on stage who maybe when I was in the studio with them, I didn't really notice them as much Um, and vice versa. People that I thought were going to like blow my mind from the front. I was like, Oh, that was, that was a little underwhelming. And Mm. things like that. you start, when you're so in it every single day with the same people, um, you start to just get ideas of certain people, the way that they dance and and their importance in the company. And then mm. to step away and to watch from the front, you're like, wow, that's interesting. That was surprising to see that mm. I had this person I hadn't even wasn't even on my radar before. And I was like, wow, they really I picked up on them right away. And. And it kind of made sense to then like some casting things that you've seen over the years. And because a lot of times that's really hard to understand when you're in it too, because you don't really mm-hmm. see the perspective from, of the director from the front. And um, there are people that just dance differently on stage than they do in the studio or. Mm. Um, so that was interesting to me. It was cool because I, the company did a new ballet this year. Uh, it's they did Jane Eyre, which is like her name's Kathy Marston, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken. She's from. She originally did it um, in Ireland mm. on the company there, and she came and set it here. Which I tried. I stayed away from the studio the whole time they were rehearsing. I wanted to have like a fresh view of it from the front. I didn't want to be influenced in any way. Mm. And it was really interesting to sit down from the front and like the orchestra started to not know anything about a ballet to not even know the music of the ballet I was like this is such a weird feeling I have Mm. no idea what I'm about to see I really enjoyed it I thought it was cool um so that was that was interesting too to have the perspective of almost like a first time ballet goer because I had no idea what I was about to see Mm. um Mm. and then I think it's just for like on a personal level of how I felt now going back into the company, I think maybe some things that we make into such a huge, huge, huge deal in the moment, when you step away from it and watch it from the front, that you realize that maybe it's not such a big, big, big deal. I mean, yes, it's important for Mm. spacing to be correct and for lines to be straight and all that stuff. But it's more like we were talking about before, like the overall feeling of what you're you're trying to portray is what you really see more than anything else. Mm. Um, Especially at the Met. I mean, the Met's a huge, huge, huge theater. Mm -hmm. So all these little teeny tiny things that sometimes we get so upset about, or we get ourselves in a, in a snit about, I was like, wow, I didn't even realize that I've never seen any of those things that were happening. Because you know, I'd Mm. go back and talk to the dancers after like, did you see that? Did you see this? Did you see so no, I didn't see any of that. <laughs> right. And I have like a trained eye. I'm not just right. Like, and I guess I could tell if something was maybe a little under rehearsed or something like that. But but the, all these things that people were saying, I was like, wow, I didn't notice any of that. Like wow. you couldn't tell at all. Mm. Mm. So it's it's something to like keep in the back of my mind sometimes when you know we go back and I might have a moment of like I can't believe I did that or like you know something had gone. I what I thought was disastrously wrong, and you're like, well, maybe it it wasn't even that noticeable. Right, right, right. Uh, but it should still you should still try to do the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, so much for uh, for joining us today and uh, and being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. For information about Alex and her fellow company members, visit www.abt.org. This episode was brought to you by Charm City Ballet. If you live in the greater Baltimore area, don't forget to check out Charm City Ballet located in Cockeysville. Visit www.charmcityballet.com for information on classes, auditions, and upcoming performances. Next week, we have former professional contemporary ballet dancer Brian Carey Chung on the show. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving Valley and Beyond a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For questions and guest requests, please email us at balletandbeyondpodcast at gmail.com. I'm your host, Pete Commander. Thanks for listening. Thank you.